Hello and welcome to another episode of the Viva Bastardo show brought to you by the Haggerty Podcast Network. Today I am so extraordinarily delighted to have on as a guest, I'm trying to get Fabrizio's name right, Fabrizio Bonamassa Siliani, the head designer of Bulgari, the guy responsible for the Octo Finissimo watch. We talk about watches, obviously cars, uh, denim, ballpoint pens, uh, a whole range of things. It's the most delightful conversation, so let's get into it. This podcast is brought to you by AeroVault. AeroVault was designed by Pete Brock, who just so happens to be the legendary designer of the Corvette Stingray and the Shelby Daytona Coupe. It's a car trailer that's made of aluminum and composite materials, incredibly efficient, incredibly aerodynamic. Uh, it's just a beautiful thing to look at also, as it turns out. Find out more at aerovault.com or call them at Henderson, Nevada at 702-843-5320 and tell them Haggerty sent you. I have to, I have to confess that I was watching some videos of yours, Fabrizio, uh, and I yeah. felt a sense of shame at my sartorial failings. <laughs> Because you're you're like the emperor of style, so I thought, all right, I'll put this little. Th My wife was like, "Do you know? Make an effort for this man." <laughs> she saw me watching your videos. Beautiful, beautiful linen shirt, and uh, even more beautiful Mida on the wrist. No, no, no! This is not ah, a Midas. Oh, what is this? Ah, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> it was so so fast. <laughs> <laughs> that was it's well you're not far it's a it's actually a prototipo i have ah, to confess that i am interesting I've been, I, well, I don't want to make this about me but i i've been i've been i've been trying to make something with a friend of mine i know uh, i in, know in, uh, inspired by the midas and brutalist architecture so this yeah, this, this thing <laughs> it reminds me even the do you remember for sure the omega uh, the, the square, the rectangular one with the faceted uh, elements. The ceramic one? No, 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 no. The the steel one, the steel one of the seventies. Oh yeah, I yeah, send yeah, you the, a picture. Uh, yeah, I know exactly. I don't remember the name. It's, yeah, it's, uh, exactly. It's um, a, is it a sea master or something? It's it's a uh, it's a oh, it's a rectangle, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. Okay. The the one thing that bugs me about that design, it has that little <laughs> that little oval plaque. You know what I yeah. mean? I never liked yeah. that. I don't, know, I don't know why it always irritated me so much. <laughs> it's the first time that I use this uh, this uh, object Headphones. here. Yes, <laughs> but I think it's better for uh, for the quality of the sound. Yes, I think it's for sure. better for for you. Yeah. Okay. I like this is a I like the Fabrizio uh, movie set behind. Uh, uh, this one. No, the whole thing. You've got all these amazing. You've got bits of engines. You've got an, a manifold. Ah, yes. You have a. You have yes. A, you have all these sketches. You have a portrait. <laughs> the portrait is uh, Marc Antoine Coulon, a, a fashion artist in Paris, okay. who made it for me for an exhibition, and it was a big, big surprise because I love uh, Marc Antoine uh, works. The engine is an Honda, an Honda two-cylinder engine V2. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the exhaust manifold I get in, in London uh, 20 years ago, it's come from a Formula One engine, it's a V10, Ma amazing, made in titanium, sealed <laughs> one by one, it's a great <laughs> obsession, it's changed every time that I move from a house to the other, you see this manifold that moves, <laughs> and now... <laughs> <laughs> and now it's in my it's in my office. So okay. well, before we well, we should we should probably tell everyone who you are, Fabrizio. So first of all, yeah. thank you so much for coming. Um, you are you've been head designer at Bulgari uh, watches specifically for well not head design but you've been there for twenty plus years. Is that correct? I joined the I joined the company in two thousand and one. Okay. Um, I, now I am the product creation executive director because, for sure, eighty percent of my job it's uh, with my team. It's uh, making watches, but uh, even uh, sometimes jewelry collection, accessories, uh, and many other things. So, in a certain moment, they change my job description to have a more wide uh, approach. Is it is it is it fair to say that you are the the, the godfather of or the grandfather? I'm not sure. Some some relative, some important some family, family member <laughs> of the Octo Finissimo. Though. I mean, you basically created that from well, so on the shoulders of the Genta design. 
Allora, uh, I joined the company in 2001 before I was a designer in Fiat Centro Stile in Turin. Uh, let me say uh, that I, I started my career when I was four. I started making sketches when I was four uh, on, on the floor uh, all the afternoon making sketches and sketches. And I started making sketches about superheroes and comics, but honestly, I was not interested in the story just on the, on the drawings. And immediately after I started to make sketches about cars. And at a certain moment I decided to change. Uh, I was in Fiat uh, and I say, but I love watches as well. So I, I sent so some why sketches. Did, what, sorry, why did you, why did you, what made you start making drawings of cars? What was, what was it about cars that made you want to draw uh, them? It was thank to, thanks to my father. He worked in the rental car uh, company. American rental car company, so makes a lot of trip, business trip to Europe or to to US, and uh, often come back at home with a big book, uh, the the old uh, American cars of the year. No, you know the big book with the small pictures of the seventies. So yeah. I started to discover this amazing world when I was very young, and I say, but it's an interesting object. This is, was my approach from the beginning. I love the shapes and proportions uh, and. Uh, more than performance and uh, obsession for speed. Um, but do you remember anyway, some of the ones you, you, do you remember some of the first ones you drew? No, honestly not. I remember some drawings of Flash Gordons or uh, Superman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, right, Submariner, well, let, let, this let kind me of ask thing. You, let me ask you this then. Do you, because I have very clear memories of me as a kid growing up in England in the 70s, walking to school and there were a few cars I just, stuck in my mind there, there was a there was an aston martin lagonda i think we were oh, talking wow. about that the other day yes. on on yeah. instagram god yeah. I mean, it was like a spaceship <laughs> then there was the porsche 928 also like a spaceship and Amazing. then i remember uh a bmw six like a 635 maybe yeah so do the you shark have, knows yes exactly so do you have <laughs> like do you have a mem memories no. from childhood as a specific like no these snapshots? honestly no, because uh, I start to to discover the automotive industry more from the coach builders than the, the company car, let me say. So I, I, I was more uh, obsessed by Pininfarina, Carrozzeria Touring, first of all, uh, Bertone, Pininfarina, uh, Ital Design, Zagato, all these kind of things. And um, I start to start to make sketches about cars, just like uh, a box with a wheel. Um, and after I start to discover the, the coach builder's world. So I, that's why maybe I don't have any images in my mind about mm. uh, my first uh, car sketch. So what, um, we, what, what drew you started, as you said, you started at uh, Fiat in the design uh, uh, area, yeah. but what made you, what tore you away from there towards watches? What was the, because you, it seems like you were so convinced when you were young at the, at mm. about the idea of yeah. So what, what made you change that? So I studied, my secondary school was uh, the artistic school in Italy, Liceo Artistico, and after Industrial Design University. And uh, for me, a designer must be able to design a lot of different things. Uh, I joined the Fiat Group thanks to uh, the architetto Ermanno Cressoni, that it was even uh, the, the, the chief designer of uh, Alfa Romeo. And after he became uh, the, uh, the coordinator of Fiat Group, Fiat Alfa and Lancia. And, um, I don't know. I met him during the university and I make degree thesis with Fiat. And immediately after I was hired as a designer. In a certain moment, uh, I say, but I don't know. I would love to change. I love to design so many different things. For sure, the car is one of the most uh, complex objects that you can imagine, even to draw, because you don't have just one straight line. Even if you imagine it's like a box with a wheel, you don't have one straight line even in terms of perspective. So I love, first of all, Phil, I love to make sketches. And uh, I love to make sketches about cars, about chairs, about bags, about sunglasses, about watches. In a certain moment, I say, but I love even watches. Bulgari is a not common brand in watchmaking industry. Fiat was not, honestly, the most exciting moment. Uh, it was in the, in the middle, from the past and the future. And uh, but it was an amazing experience because I met uh, still today I'm in contact with some colleagues. We were 40 on the same room. 
and we spend all the day until 9, 10 p.m. drawing scars. It was amazing. It was my first job. It was my dream. So it was unbelievable. Uh, great, uh, great experience. I have to say great know-how, but the situation was not so easy. And uh, after a few years, they start to change a lot. I feel like um, the, 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 you always talk about drawing in your interviews. And I feel like uh, it, when you draw, it's a way of having, you're having a dialogue with yourself. Mm. About... Um, no? Let me say, let me say, I love making sketches. This is the first connection between the brain and uh, the hand. As a designer, my biggest skill, I have to say, is the way that I have to imagine object that doesn't exist. Is in my brain. My brain is like a wide frame. So I see the object that turns, I can disassembling, assembling, I go in, I look in this way. Um, that's why I make sketches in a very precise way. But I think if you want to become a designer, you have to be curious and you have to, you must have this kind of skills to see object that doesn't exist yet. Because if you can see it, you can make in sketches. And I love sketches because it's like a prototype in, uh, in car industry. So it's the beginning of the idea. And when you start to imagine something, you see that the pens start to make some lines, some strokes on the paper, and you start to build up the idea. This is the things that I love, honestly. It's the beginning of the creative process. But what sounds interesting to me is that when you start drawing, you don't really know the destination. Mm. Um, honestly, I know, the, oh, I know do. the destination. You know exactly know where you're going every time. Yes. Are yes. you never surprised um, by unexpected visitors? Yes. Sometimes I'm surprised. Sometimes the square at the beginning, the watch is round. At the end of the process is a square or is like on an octagonal watch. This is very interesting things because you have to be able... Uh, you are a pro in the creative process, so you have to be able to manage the creativity. At the beginning, when you make the sketch, immediately you can see there is a stroke that's more interesting than the other. You cut and you start to develop other things. Like when you make pictures, you can see some details and you start to discover more and more. Ah, you, so, know, you're, you, you're, you know what you're talking about? You're talking about being ruthless. <laughs> because you, 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 and you, and clearly you, have, you must have a very... Um, excellent instinct in the sense of you know you make a line and you re recognize immediately this is the wrong line and you cut it you don't have a discussion yeah. about is it or not you just know it's no. wrong and then you move to a different line i don't know i'm 50 and i start my career uh, when i was five so uh, <laughs> in a certain moment uh, at the at the liceo artistico in a, some days you spend more or less four plus four hours making drawings and for, uh, I let me say, more than 10 years of my life, I design and I make sketches for more or less 20 hours. So uh, even I, I slept very, very little when I was young because I was obsessed to discover shapes uh, and different techniques. So you have to imagine that I was born in Naples and I grew up in Rome. No way to talk about cars to discover techniques. And uh, in the automotive industry, you have a very specific way to making sketches. And uh, I discover all these things on the, on the magazines. Sorry, and, what's uh, the, when, so let me just go back to that for a second. Well, what's the specific way of, in, of making sketches in the car business? Like, what, uh, there, obsession for uh, the perspective are very important and the perspective are very, very difficult. Today with the tablet, you can start to play with the picture on a, on a different layers and uh, you can start making drawings on top of this layer and often uh, is a picture of a car. So you cannot make mistake about proportions and the size of the wheel and even uh, the, the way to design the ellipse of the wheel. That is the most difficult things. But when I was young, it was just the paper, the markers, and the markers after five hours, six hours of this, uh, uh, let me say it was, you are completely drunk because it was alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> During the winter, you close, right. the, you close the window and you start to draw in, in a certain moment say, well, maybe I have to open the window because I need the fresh air. <laughs> well, maybe, the, maybe that's how you could come up with some amazing designs, Fabrizio. <laughs> exactly. For some designers, uh, this is a plus. <laughs> So do you, think anyway, you, do you think you design, do you design watches as if you were designing a car in terms of the yes. surfaces and the perspective? You do? Yeah. 
Yeah, Interesting. exactly in the same way. Uh, in a certain moment, I start to make sketches about watches and I send the sketches to Mr. Uh, Paolo Bulgari and the sketches were was in an A3 size for the automotive industry. It's small. Right. For the watches, is uh, 20 times bigger than a real size. So I start to make sketches about these huge watches with the amazing crown, all the details about the lugs because I was into watches. I love watches from the beginning. And Mr. Paolo said, Fabrizio, these sketches are amazing, but honestly, you design a crown that is, is like <laughs> in this size, <laughs> but they have to become something like that. I don't know. I don't know how is it possible to have all these kind of details in the real size. They say, but we will see. We don't care. But at the end, it was a, it was a fantastic uh, opportunity. And, uh, and now we have the Octo. Exactly. Well, the, so, I mean, look, I think it's, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of this, Fabrizio, but the Octo has been a bit of a success. <laughs> I, <don't>, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I don't know if you've, if you've noticed, <laughs> but I think, it's, I, I think it's fair to say that it's, it's really the... the the, the first iconic watch, I would say, of, of the 21st century um, in, in terms of how singular it is. I mean, the thing I, I as you, I'm a huge fan of 70s watches in particular, mm -hmm. what I love about them is the ones with the integrated bracelets because they design them yeah. as a complete thing, as a complete sculptural unit. And that's what you've done with your Octo. You've designed everything, the bracelet and everything, so it integrates in this beautiful sculptural way. Um, you Sorry, go on, go on. You get the point. This is the unique innovation in the, in the 70s watches, the integrated bracelet. Before it was a round shape watch or a rectangular shape watch with the lugs and the bracelet uh, fixed in. Right. The, the biggest innovation, uh, it's uh, for sure a rectangular watch or octagonal watches. Everybody knows this kind of story. But for me, the legacy of the 70s is the integrated bracelet, metal bracelet. Yeah. So that's, that's it was that, something you were thinking about when you designed the Octo all those years ago in with the bracelet? So, Bulgari uh, both manufactured the Zotro Logerie in 1999 from our glass. We didn't buy Gerald Genta from Gerald Genta. So Gerald Genta and Daniel Roth already sold the company. We bought uh, almost an empty space with a lot of uh, components, an amazing know-how, but nothing on the, on the shelf. And we start to imagine the evolution of these two brands. For sure, we start to hire managers to manage the company and uh, say, guys, we have to do something with the Octo, with the, with the Gerald Genta because it's a very important brand. It's a prestigious brand. Everybody knows Gerald Genta for the octagonal shape. So we must have a new octagonal watch. And they start making sketches with some external suppliers, uh, some external consultant. They make uh, just one sketch made with uh, with uh, pencils. In a certain moment, this uh, this external consultant, uh, I don't know, it was it was out. Uh, it start to have a business trip or another kind of trip, and they ask. Uh, to the design center in Rome with other external consultant to develop an octo shape, an octagonal watch. And we start to imagine this, this kind of things. One of my first job when I joined the company was to design a metal bracelet for this shape. Um, in a certain moment, uh, they start to develop the case. We start to design the case with the octagonal shape, with the, uh, with the round shape on top. And this is the watch that we have today. In 2009, we decided to have just one company because it was so difficult to manage for Bulgari to have three different watch brands. They start to open uh, their boutique, so it, it start to become very, very, very tough. And we decided to have just Bulgari. And we discovered again the Octo because before the, the Bulgari management, it was full of different things. The inspiration was the gambler in, uh, in a casino. I don't know. It was uh, full of different color, just uh, be retrograde and be retro and quadri retro and retrograde function on the dial for Bulgari and from our point of view, it was a bit too much. So we stay back to the roots and uh, we try to have a simple watch with this kind of amazing shape, but it was a big surprise for us. It was a quite a success, the Octo with a steel small bracelet. Amount, small amount of success. Yes, but it was <laughs> not so thin. And in a right. certain moment, uh, we have to say, guys, we have to find our path because we are one of the most iconic jewel makers. We come from Rome, but we don't have a big connection with the aviation world, with the racing world, with, uh, I don't know, uh, golf world. So at the end, it's a very unique brand in terms of design of jewelry, 
with a different style because we are Italians, we come from Rome, Gianni Bulgari, Nicola Bulgari, Paolo Bulgari, very well known around the world for their style. So Dolce Vita in Rome, we have to say something different. And he say, but honestly, we have an amazing know-how in our facilities. We are able to make the thinnest movement in the world today in some complication. We have to develop, we have to try to develop this kind of path. And we start all in to develop new movement, starting from the amazing know-how that we, we discover in the company. 20 years before, more or less, 15 years before. And this is the story. The beginning was just a manual winding tourbillon, 30 pieces. The second year in Basel was 30 pieces of minute repeater. Again, everybody say, bravi, you are able to make 30 pieces. But uh, the game changed a bit when we arrived at the, the three the, the second year with the man with automatic uh, movement. Ultra thin, automatic in titanium case, titanium dial and titanium bracelet. Everybody say, guys, they are something different. You're really, um, I have to say, I feel like you're a bit of a contrarian, Fabrizio, because it seems to me from what I've read that you, <laughs> you, are, you, are bo- <laughs> you are both a contrarian, but you're also conceptual. <laughs> Like for for you, what matters? There, were, I was reading some story. You, I was listening to some story you were talking, telling about. Um, I mean, I can't remember what we were making. A, oh, the minute repeater. That's right. And yeah. and apparently, everyone was talking about the idea of oh, it should be done this precious metal. Yes. And yes. you were this saying, is, and yeah, and then you were saying, you wanted it to be titanium because that will work yes. conceptually in terms of how the repeater will <laughs> sound. At the end, uh, Phil, you know, you have, we have a lot of beautiful objects with a very old engineering, and we have a lot of objects with an amazing engineering and very old style or nothing special. In a certain moment during the meeting, and it was uh, still today on my, on my brain, so uh, guys, we have to find a different material because uh, we have to say something different. Okay, now we have the thinnest minute repeater in the world, but I think it's too thin. The hammers are very thin, the gongs are very thin, so the problem is maybe... We don't have enough sound that comes out from this case. Why don't you use the titanium? I don't know. You know, it's uh, it's the one of the most uh, incredible complications in the Swiss watchmaking industry. We have to use a noble material. They say, yes, but if you use a noble material, maybe you cannot hear the sound. And uh, the second point, we are not Swiss. We come from Rome. And please, if you use the titanium, I want to see the real color of titanium. No finishing, no polished surface that look like steel. I would love to have this warm gray color. And imagine, minute repeater with this kind of case with integrated bracelet in titanium. It looks like uh, the watch that comes from the outer space. So uh, how, you have to how, make... How hard was it to persuade people because I've, to, to, to do that? Because I feel like in the watch world in particular, there mm-hmm. are such ingrained habits about what yeah. things represent. Alli- you know, if you're doing a dress watch, must have the shiny alligator strap. You know what I mean? There are these things that, that, that people kind of live by. So how hard was that for you to, to persuade them the Fabrizio idea was the right one? Uh, uh, first of all, it's never the Fabrizio idea well, because you could have some ideas, but uh, behind a lot of people behind you, you can make just some sketches. Okay. At the end, uh, um, at the beginning... I miss a very important part. At the beginning of my job, the design center was in Rome. 11 years ago, I say, guys, if we want to make something different, we have to move the design center from Rome to Neuchâtel in Switzerland, where I am now because our facilities are in Switzerland. And uh, at the beginning, when I arrived in Switzerland, Sorry, I what joined... what was the reason for that, though, Fabrizio? Why, what, what, why the... move from Rome to... Because you, because you, you speak so much about... Clearly, being Italian and everything that you get from Italy is yeah. so important to who you are and how you create. So why leave that for Switzerland? Because it was impossible in 2010 uh, to have a certain flexibility and speed in product development process. So okay. I start. To, I make sketches in Rome. I send the sketches in Switzerland. They have to make the 3D file. They send me the 3D file in Rome. I say, okay, and they have to move the prototype. When they have the prototype, they send me the prototype and with the customs and this kind of thing, you have to wait three, four days 
You have to see the prototype and you don't have enough time because you have to send the prototype back in Switzerland because otherwise you, you are you are losing 10 days. So it was so long. If you want to make something different with this engagement in, uh, in movements, uh, I say, guys, it's impossible to do. I spend more time in Switzerland than in Italy uh, now. Honestly, it doesn't make sense. And we decided to move the design center from Rome to Switzerland. Well, ideas have their own momentum, right? Particularly when you're it's, working on something that's really inspiring, that's really great. The, in some, often I find that sometimes the speed of things enhances the creativity. And so at the, the situation you're just describing, being in Rome and, yes. and, and Switzerland, it, must have, it, kind of, it kind of distorts the creative process, I would imagine. I totally agree with you. You lose the momentum. You are not in the in the same uh, in the same uh, mood uh, if you are far away. Now it's easier because with Zoom, with all this kind of technology, you can print a very fast prototype uh, wherever you want. And uh, with the 3D file that we have today, with amazing rendering uh, and virtual reality that we have, you can have a, a Google and you can see all what you want in the virtual reality. But 11 years ago, it was a bit different. So uh, now I'm lost. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just, you're saying so many interesting things. I want to, some of those things I want to, I want to kind of, ex, you know, delve into. <laughs> we're to, we're, we're, uh, I'm, lo I'm also lost. This is what happens to men in their 50s. They have a conversation halfway through. They forget what they were talking about. They forget who they are. <laughs> Well, let's, let's talk a bit. You, you also, you had mentioned something um, in one of your talks. You, 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 as I said earlier, being Italian, Italy, every, it's very important to you, it seems. Um, and you said something about, um, in Italy, beauty matters in a way that doesn't elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, beauty for us is not a philosophical concept. For the Italians, uh, talking about uh, Achille Castiglioni, and so Mari, but even uh, Bruno Munari, the beauty was a real necessity for us. You have to imagine that in our life in Italy, during the centuries, you, you have a lot of different dominations, starting from the Roman kingdom to the Arabic one, to the Spanish one in the south of Italy. So during the centuries, even the Rinascimento, the French domination, so at the end, uh, we had we be in contact with so many different cultures and all this kind of culture left something on the field. So I imagine our beauty culture like a multi-layer, like a cake with different uh, with different yeah. layers. That's why Archaeology. The, yes, that's why the Italian needs for beauty is totally different from, from the other design culture, for example. For us, form, follow, function, honestly, is not enough. We talk about the beauty that have to follow the function. And sometimes it's the function and it's the constraints that drive the aesthetics. It was exactly the same of the octo with the minute repeater. Please, I want to hear the sound, so use the titanium. And if you use the titanium, I want to see the color. That's it. So you make the aesthetics through the, through the, through the needs. And... Uh, you have to imagine that when you spend time in Italy, you wake up in the morning, you open the windows and you have an amazing landscape. If you are in Florence, you can see, I don't know, so many different things. If you are in Rome, again, if you are in Naples, in Venice, in Palermo, but you can hear even, I don't know, uh, Pavarotti or Giuseppe Verdi or something like that. And you can even eat an amazing croissant or an amazing uh, dishes of pasta well made by hand. So for us, this concept is the beauty. We found beauty it's, in it's craftsmanship. A, it's at a molecular level, it sounds. I mean, it's exactly. interesting because, because there's, there's two places I've been where, um, where everything matters. And one is, is Italy and the other is Japan. And I find that everywhere else, for things to matter, you must pay for them to matter. Mm. as opposed to it sounds to me that what you're talking about in Italy is it, it just matters reflexively because that's it's just a DNA yeah that's interesting yeah. honestly this is my idea eh? but honestly I don't know if it's true or not but we have this kind of multi-connection uh, perception of beauty it's not something that we want to just see but we want to hear, we want to feel, we want to taste. Imagine the obsession that we have in Naples for the coffee 
or for the pizza. This is an amazing flavor, an amazing smell. You start from the smell and after you see the color and after you taste it and it's wow, it's so, how is deep and how is rich this taste, but it's just a coffee that honestly I don't drink. But I'm obsessed for the pizza and for mozzarella, for example. So it's very deep for us, the culture of beauty. That's why we are never satisfied. That's why after the Second World War, thanks to this group, small group of architects, they completely redesigned, first of all, the houses, because uh, the Italy after the Second World War was is totally destroyed. And they start to build up the new, uh, the new space around the man, and new space around all these kind of things that uh, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Army left on the field, like a washing machine, like a frigidaire, for example. It was totally something that we never, we never seen. So, and after the Italians discovered the plastic, so imagine these two kind of things with the economic boom, and uh, they discovered the industrial design. But the obsession and the final, the, the aim of a designer is to improve the quality of life through the objects. Even if you are just you have to play with the bracelet of the Octofinissimo, wow, it's super smooth. That's it. For, for, for us, that's enough. <laughs> well, <laughs> man, it's, it's, fat, it's, it's really glorious listening to you talk because you are, you are so um, passionate. It's a terrible, terrible word. Um, but it, it, you're, it, it's, it's kind of glorious. Uh, so do you find that... The, when you approach, you talk about these kind of multi-layer, this kind of archaeology yeah. of experience yeah. initially. So when you design things, do you, is every, I would imagine that there's this kind of archaeology of experience that happens when you make things, this kind of, this multi-layering, when you design a watch, it's about, like you say, the kind of, the beauty of the way the strap just moves in your, I mean, that's one of the things I love about the 70s stuff is the, the Patek straps, the mm. way they just, they feel almost like silk, but they're made of white gold. Yeah. And I just think, how do they make that? Yeah. Yeah. This is the sour. This is the sour fare at the end. Honestly, I don't know. I'm not able to reply to your question. It's something that today is in my fingers, is in my DNA. My brain looks a lot for emotions. The inspiration often, ninety percent, comes from an emotion, from a smell, from a something that you have seen, uh, and in a certain moment you start to imagine something. You have another kind of inspiration that is very precise. You receive a brief, the car, for example, this is the wheelbase, this is the packaging, this is the H point, this is the hood, this is the, the luggage that you have to put inside. And after you have it, tons of regulation. So at the end, the problem today is that you have to do something uh, more or less uh, like that. Took the point all together and you have, uh, and you have the car. So that's why you don't have so many. This is so a legendary moment in podcasts, man. Fabrizio is doing a drawing live. <laughs> I make drawings every moment of my <laughs> life. So, <laughs> do you think, do you, let me ask you this, man. Do you, um, would you like to design a car? I still today, I design car, uh, but I'm more passionate on shapes and proportions. Honestly, I think that design car is very tough. Um, it's difficult there, to say is, something. Is, is there not one that secretly you've been kind of drawing for years, like this little, this, this idea that you've no. had for, no, nothing? No, no, honestly, no. I have some ideas. I start to make sketches. I make four, five, 10, 11, 12 sketches. And after, okay, it's done. Uh, I change. Or I or honestly, I forgot because imagine you the emails, the meetings, or I have an idea. It was during today and was discussing about uh, another project. And I say to one of our designers, stop, stop, stop. I have to uh, I have to write down something because otherwise it's completely lost forever. That's why I always have pens and, and paper with me. Uh, but the most important one is the pens because you can, uh, you can sketch and uh, write down everywhere. Um, but honestly, I don't know. It's tough today because it's more style than, uh, than design. You have to imagine that in Italy, we don't have a word to say design. It's one of the most rich language in terms of uh, words, but we don't have just one word to say design. In Italy, we say applied art to the industry. This is our concept. That is too long and we use an American words because thanks to Raymond Lowy, we have uh, the design, uh, the, the, the professional, uh, the, professional the, the workers at the end. 
So for us, it is each time something different because it's passionate. Uh, that's why after the Second World War, you have this amazing car. But even before the Second World War, you have this amazing car because you have to imagine, for example, the Sergio Scaglietti, for me, still today, the most beautiful Ferrari ever made. It doesn't make one sketch. It just to have the idea with the hammers on the, on the aluminum with wood frame on top, say, you see the 250 Testarossa, you say the 250 California, the 150 Tour de France. So maybe the most incredible cars. Mm. I still have very strong connection with touring because for me, it may be the most elegant car ever made. Uh, Wait, which one? The 8C, the 6C, oh, the 8C, yeah. the Disco Volante. Uh, so the, the list is so long, honestly. It's impossible for me. The first uh, the first uh, uh, Lamborghini that was not made by Touring, was made by Scaglione, but Scaglione Before it was impossible the, to produce. The 450, was it? I exactly. It was based. It was based on, on Scaglione design, but it was right. impossible for Scaglione to to produce it and they moved to Touring and Touring with Formenti, uh, the designer at the time, start to make a bit of uh, uh, fine tuning for the production. The car, it was uh, it was forgotten for decades and now I is- love, uh, uh, That's one of my all time love favorites. It. I love it. And you know, amazing. You know the other car that I find that they did in that era um, that's, that's kind of extraordinarily gracefully aged is the Islero. Ah, amazing. I love it. Honestly. But it looks so modern. Yeah. It looks so yeah. Now, now it looks so modern. In a certain moment, they start. Wow, it's beautiful. Now it's very old, and now it starts to become modern. Right. This is the evolution of taste at the end. Well, here's an interesting question for you. So, well, <laughs> maybe it's not interesting. <laughs> we'll see when it comes out. <laughs> um, so, you know how Lamborghini in the '70s they were so interesting. They were they were they were doing something that the car manufacturers don't do, which was that every car looked radically different it almost was like they yeah. were produced by different companies almost you know the, the yeah. yalpa the, the espada the slero they all just look completely different do you think that you've created this iconic shape the 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 octo finissimo right you've, you've got this it there is a certain gravitational pull to success that means do you think that do you know where i'm going with this or i'm not even sure where i'm going but for instance if you want to design a new watch do you is it easy to to escape from that gravitational pull of the octo finissimo and say i'm going to start something completely new that has no relation to this design depends on the question it depends on the question why if you have in front of you a different uh, layout no, at that time it was easy. Each time the layout was different. So they were obliged to follow different shape and proportions. The wheelbase, the components. Today is uh, one chassis, different sizes. So with uh, exactly the same frame, a bit wider, a bit smaller. But if you have a different platform, if you have a different scope, look at the, our lineup today. I don't want to talk about Bulgari anyway. Everybody knows our watches. But if you see, we have the Bulgari Bulgari watch from the 70s. We have the aluminum and we have the Octo Finissimo, just to say three pieces. We have even the Serpenti. We have four different iconic watches on the market. Yeah. Each time is totally different. We have a lot of watchmaking brand that uh, they are lucky. For 50, for 70 years, they make each time the same watch. <laughs> and at the end, they are lucky because they have just to change the dial. For sure, the watch is never is never the same. They completely re-engineer. But in terms of style, they want to stay, uh, honestly, stick to the, sure. to the origin. We don't have this kind of heritage. We don't have this kind of DNA, even in jewelry. You can see a lot of different collection. So for us, it's easier. We don't want to make three times, four times the same things. It starts to become boring for us. Right. But for the watchmaking uh, clients, it's tough because they are, uh, let me say, they is a sort of comfort zone. They prefer to, to have the same things. Look at the Octo. We start 14 years ago, 13 years ago. Now we are start to talk about the Octo because they need time. They be reinsured by the shapes, uh, by the technical aspect, by different things. On the lady side, it's totally different. Well, the octo fit with was, my style. The, the octo was was very unusual because you you created this kind of almost. Do you know H R Geiger the or G, uh, G, H R yes. Geiger? So yes, there's, for a, sure. there's a there's a there's a there's a kind <clears throat> of almost sort of skeletal aspect to that watch that's mm. beautiful and multi layered, as you say. 
But the thing about it was that it was a totally new design language. You you were creating new words for for. It. We we were completely open mind. We didn't follow any trends. We didn't follow any benchmark. We say, guys, now it's our turn. We have to find our path now or never. We come but from when you and that's a courageous thing to do. And when but yeah. when you create new words, when you make something new, I found or I've observed that it seems to me that. People almost always, people when they see new things, they're taken aback, and it takes them a <laughs> while for them to understand the design language, to digest it, to come to grips with it, to, to to become comfortable, and then it goes from, oh, this is kind of weird, to oh, this is amazing. But that journey often can be a while; it can take a while. Honestly, at the beginning of this journey, we say, guys, this is an amazing watch. It works very well on Turbion. It works very well in Minute Repeater in Titanium. But what's next? Mm. Even for us, it was a huge surprise because in a certain moment, uh, we were very, very daring, courageous. Uh, but we start to develop the evolution of the Octo after the second watch, for sure. At the beginning, the idea was to have a lineup. But the ultra thin uh, segment was uh, dusty and nobody cares uh, for, I don't know, 30 years. It was always the same round shaped watch with the thin bezel, white face, and black shiny alligator strap without <laughs> stitches. Without <laughs> stitches. So it was just for tuxedo, for the for the, the Carnegie Hall. Yeah. Uh, yes, it was for the opera for La Scala in, in Milan. And after you put on the on the safe. Yeah. But that was the the most incredible things. And maybe for some aspect, it was the same in the 70s. To imagine a, a sport watches made in steel that cost yeah. like a gold watch. So at the right. end, they make an amazing job. So, but Well, people forget say, how I, radical that was of an idea. Yes. I mean, that's the thing. I, you know, you look at art, you look at like Warhol or Lichtenstein, and people, but people forget how radical those yes. guys were in the, just after abstract expressionism in the 50s. And it's the same with steel watches. And it's the same. I mean, it seems to me that you... You look at you. You look at that idea of oh, ultra thin watches are, 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 are boring as an opportunity because you're a contrarian. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, very boring. So maybe we can we can do something. We discover the movement and we say now which kind of style we're gonna use for the case. In a certain moments, I say we have to use the the, the octagonal shape because nobody can expect it. Mm. And uh, we make some mistakes during my career. I make so many mistakes, but in a certain moment, we develop a finissimo moment inside a Bulgari Bulgari case. It was a round shape case with the Bulgari Roma. I still have on my on my desk. Nobody cares. Nobody cares because this kind of client already have this kind of watch. So mm. you have to be able to say something different, and you have to follow your idea uh, until the end, because otherwise, if you move. Uh, uh, right and left side, the client is completely lost. It doesn't I, follow you anymore. I think that you just said something so important because, and that's for me as an artist, that that's the most important thing is, is you ha always have to be trying to say something new yeah. because otherwise, if you're not saying something new, if you're not trying to create a new word a new to add to the vocabulary, what are you doing? And, and you've said something new with the Octo, which is fantastic. Do you, I feel like you like constraints. You I like constraints. You see opportunity in constraints. Yes, exactly. Because otherwise I'm an artist. So I can <laughs> take an amazing uh, canvas <laughs> with uh, a lot things of like things me. on top. <laughs> if you like it, okay. If you don't like it, it's your, uh, it's your problem. <laughs> but as a designer, if you don't use my object, uh, I miss something. Mm. And that's the point at the end, uh, I'm never satisfied. We are never satisfied. So when I see on the wrist of a gentleman, an Octo Finissimo or a Bulgari Aluminium, I'm very happy, but I'm always thinking, okay, what's next? Now I have a problem. Once Michael Burke, that was a CEO, a Bulgari CEO for, I don't know, less than one year when we joined the, the LVMH group, say, Fabrizio, you know, you could have success with one product. You could have lucky, you could have a lot of things, the perfect storm. But when you have the second success, it means that you 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 well understood the, the lesson because everybody can make one object that you success. But the problem is that you have to make the second one. And the second one is the most difficult, honestly. 
So I'm my sure. obsession is what's next? <laughs> well, well, of course, because the, the, the second one is the hardest because you've been successful yes. with the first. So people are but people are going, OK, they're both expecting something great and expecting failure simultaneously. Yeah. Honestly, now I'm looking for the third one because the first uh, huge success of the company was the Serpenti to Bogas. Mm. in 2009 if i remember well um, nobody can expect because we used the tubo gas on different collection i jury watches uh, and we say guys you maybe should, we you can just expect, you should just explain to people what tubo gas is because some people uh, tubo, gas, uh, uh, tubo gas is a, a part of our dna tubo gas literally is a gas pipe yeah. so uh in the beginning of the 30s uh i don't know why because i <laughs> I don't, I don't want the company. So I joined the company <laughs> after, uh, in the beginning of the 30, we start to develop, uh, a, a tubo gas watch is a, is a technique in jewelry world to have these, uh, uh, two elements of gold that turns around the spring. Mm. So at the end uh, is a tubular uh, construction with a spring inside. So this, uh, bracelet wrapping your, uh, your wrist. And in a certain moment, we start to discover the, the snake shape. So we put together the snake and the tubo gas, the gas pipe, and become a huge success. Elizabeth Terrell used a lot, uh, Sofia Loren. So Bul Bulgari became very popular thanks to the Dolce Vita. And even because uh, we had an amazing, amazing jewelry during this period. And all the most important actresses and actors and directors spent time in Rome during this period. So Bulgari became huge. And uh, in a certain moment, the tubo gas was just a, a piece of gold, very heavy, with, uh, with a snake sometimes with a lot of diamonds on top of the head. So it was medium and high high-end price product. But we never discover, we never start to use a tubo gas in steel or tubo gas in different things. And always with a, with a double, uh, the Bulgari, Bulgari head. In a certain moment, I try to put all the things together, part of the DNA of the company. And I say, guys, it's long story short. The brief was to discover, to design the new Bulgari Bulgari tubo gas. At the end, we arrived with the new Serpenti tubo gas. So that's just to explain that sometimes you start <laughs> with an idea. It was after four product meetings with, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't remember, maybe 15 prototypes on the table. And in a certain moment, I say, guys, honestly, we have to be honest, it's impossible to have a better watch than this one. It's perfect. It's very, it's very well done. It's very absolutely interesting to wear on the wrist in terms of ergonomics. It's perfect. Uh, just a round shaped case with the double logo is a statement. Everybody loves it. We cannot make the better one. So why don't we make a Serpenti? Oh, come on. Serpent, it was just eye and watches. But honestly, we don't have nothing on the table. You can try. And today we have the biggest success of the company. So I love, I love the uh, Serpenti, I think. I love that. Well, yeah. I, I, what I like about that idea is the, is kind of exploding the wristwatch outwards. Actually, yeah. I, and I, I, I really wish that they were, I wish there would be some version for men that would be, mm. that men would wear. And, and it, they wouldn't wear Serpenti, but I, but I feel like, I wonder if there's a way in which to, to, move the watch beyond the bracelet, the thing that it is now for men? Like, is there a way to expand that in the way that Serpenti did for women and make it more sculptural on the wrist, mm. but in a way this that is men a would subject. wear? This is a subject, honestly, we talk a lot about this kind of topic, uh, gender in watch industry, uh, Serpenti for men, Finissimo for ladies, uh, but from my point of view, the clients can buy all what he wants. So at the end... Uh, sure. But we will see for the future. I suspect for men, for that to work for men, it would be about materials. Could be. Could be. <laughs> That's my gift to you, Fabrizio. From my years Thank of you design... so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> from my years of designing watches, I give you this gift. <laughs> so I know I know that you also um, you have a peculiar obsession with denim. Is that ah, right? that's yes. <laughs> honestly, honestly, I don't know why. I don't know why. In a certain <laughs> because I love Japan, maybe. 
I love Japan because I love the obsession for perfection and details. So yeah. uh, I start to I start to talk with a lot of uh, friends uh, why the Japanese have this kind of uh, sour fare in terms of denim, and uh, we discovered that they both all the the the, the, the old machine that in Europe and the US they try to 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 use as a waste right. and they take it because the Japanese are very amazing for this kind of things and they discover again from scratch a new DNA um that's why I love this kind of fabrics because as an industrial designer I love the things without any decorative elements so the denim was uh, created for a specific purpose and is the best uh, fabrics uh, if you have a specific, uh, I don't know, things to do. It's uh, very stylish. I love the color, the shades of all the indigo, and uh, I love the very heavy weight. Uh, so 20 hots, 22, 25, something that is absolutely rigid. <laughs> <laughs> you can cut your knee when you <laughs> when you see it. But it's beautiful at the end. No decorative elements, co- uncomfortable at all. But it's beautiful because the sour fare, you have to imagine the Japanese that start to play with the with this kind of so that's why I love it. I mean, what I find that one of the, well, I, I spent I spent a lot of time in Japan when I used to work in advertising and I really, like you, I fell in love with, with the the country and the culture and the way they do things. But one of the things they, that, that's always so extraordinary is the way in which they take things that seem, um, that, that like you say, that people in the West have kind of not uh, are bored with. And mm-hmm. then they'll kind of, or they'll, they'll take like a, I'm actually wearing right now, they, 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 it's like the, they'll take the idea of a Converse sneaker and then they'll refine it and refine it and make it into yeah. this extraordinary version of what a com- of, of, of what a Converse sneaker conceptually might have been fifty years ago and is no longer. And there's something. But you have. Go on, sorry. You, you have to imagine that to to work with this kind of denim when you made just uh, jeans, you have to work with a specific machine. So in a certain moment, uh, I bought a lot of denim and I say to my tailor in Rome, uh, Giuseppe. I want to have jackets, double breast, uh, single breast, and trousers in denim. But please make it in a proper way. This is the denim. But Fabrizio is so thick. So I love to wear jacket with applied pocket. <laughs> and uh, in a certain moment, when you have the pocket that turns and you have the fabric from behind, you have three different layers of denim. And say, Fabrizio, is impossible to cut and to and to stitch it is impossible we're, we're coming so, back to this your obsession with layers you, yeah, exactly. you i feel like you're actually exactly. i feel like you're layers yeah, yeah i feel like you're an archae- you're an archaeologist in, in a way yeah maybe maybe you're right maybe you're right <laughs> or a geologist like you like yeah. all these you, uh... <laughs> by so, the end so do you wear the, do you have a denim suit yes two two and uh, I have a lot of denims, uh, trousers uh, made by different friends that makes uh, this kind of things, or even for Japanese company, uh, because I obsessed to see video about the way that they stitch and the way that they cut uh, the salvage denim, uh, the color, the indigo, how many times they put it. <laughs> so it's a, it's a bit an obsession. Is I'm nerd for some, uh, some, some reasons, uh, like cars at the end. Right. To discover the section. I make sketches and you, on my Instagram account. I honestly, I don't want to make drawings about uh, the old car. I just to make sketches about a certain portion that I love because honestly, it's getting boring. And uh, I just say to the point, I love <laughs> these kind of details. And that's well, there it. Was, there uh, was a sketch of a car you held up for a second. It looked like the back of an F40 on your desk. Ah, uh, yes, what? we will see. We will see. <laughs> I'm not showing you anymore. Okay, that was a Fabrizio thing. I'm not that showing is... you what. A... <laughs> what is that? That looks like a something no, in the a, just, a, just a doodle. I'm obsessed. Now is the F40 moment. Is I don't it? know why. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why. It's a car that is was. Uh, I don't know. When I was young, I, mo- I was more in love for 288 GTO mm. and uh, for uh, Miura. No, Miura is too old. Uh, Countach, yes, but it's a bit too too sharp, too edgy for me. Uh, F40, yes, but more Testarossa. Testarossa, it was more uh. Gran Turismo, very elegant. The idea to have this kind of air intakes on the yeah. side. 
you know, it come from a different package. That is the, the, the meaning behind. So they change the package, they change the shape. Yeah. And this is for me, in terms of uh, designer, is very interesting things. You know what always bothered me about the F40 was the curved hood. Yeah. I just never liked how it curved down. It always felt like it was not harmonious with the rest of the car. <laughs> I totally agree with you, and I think it's not harmonious. But this is the 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 the, the beauty of this car. It's like a military object. It's uh, straight uh -huh. to the point. Uh, is uh, the the rear wing was huge, and uh, even the hood is very down. You see mm. the car from the side. It looks three different cars because yeah. at the end it was it was three different cars. Uh, do you remember the story for the 288 GTO and after become 288 GTO Evoluzione and after many people change and uh, Pininfarina people was involved and after they change, even Ferrari engineering change a lot. So at the end, the car is absolutely beauty because uh, it's not a common language in the automotive industry. It's not, let me say, it's just my opinion. Eh? It's not... Uh, is not perfect in terms of uh, connection between the different surfaces. And now that I'm obsessed a bit of the F40, I look at a lot of pictures and I make many sketches and say, how is possible that this surface has this kind of shapes? It's absolutely crazy because they make just parts to, to right. cover the engine, uh, to have the perfect air intake, because it, more, it was more the engineering that gave the shapes to the car. It was more Materazzi, the engineer so that's, Materazzi. So that's, and that's, for, that's function giving form. Yes, it's absolutely, it's like, uh, let me say, it's like the Octo Finissimo. We don't have enough room for decorative elements with this kind of piece. Have to work in a proper way. On the contrary, when you see, this is very interesting, the Porsche 959. <laughs> I another, knew you were going to say the 959. <laughs> my obsession, it was more beauty and more mm. refined in terms of shape than F40. Yeah. And it was the same moment, completely different in terms of approach, even if the German way is form follow function. This time it's more, more Italian way form follow function uh, on F40. Well, the, and on the, the 959, the, the, you see it's beautiful shape. It's, it's very sensuous, the 959. Yes. It's a much yes. more sensuous shape than the F40. I mean, you're yes. actually quite right. In a way, the 959 is more Italian and the F40 is more German, if you want to be, talk about cliches of design, If right? you see the things in a different way, yes. Yeah. Even the Testarossa, it was more extravagant than a 959 in the same moment. I love so, the Testarossa. Fun, man. interesting. The, the monospecular. I, love all the, oh, I love all the cars. That's the point. That's why I don't buy it, because uh, it was the same for motorbikes. Uh, I, I change, I don't know, I, I don't remember, maybe 10 or 15 motorbikes in the last, uh, I don't know, five years. Well, a friend of mine has the most, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm terrified of motorbikes, but he has, a, is it a La Verda? Ah, yes. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, God. And then the colors Crazy of those, machine. The, the colors yeah. of those things. The orange amazing. one. Yeah, he has the an orange one. one. And then yeah. I think there's a green one too, right? Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So crazy you machine. You haven't been tempted to buy like one sports car. Now I have a BMW Z3 uh, Roadster, three okay. liter. I don't like the M because it's a bit too much. No, it's mm. uh, in terms of proportion, big wheel. Uh, it looks that the wheels are bigger than the body, and um, but I'm never satisfied. Tempted, but, so, but you're not tempted to have something old or older. No, no, I don't have time to take care, honestly. <laughs> right. I have three or four millimilia. I was a guest uh, with amazing uh, pre-war Alfa Romeo, and uh, you have to lose a lot of time. You you need a different passion. You need a lot of time. You need a huge space to 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 recover it. And this honestly, it's not the right moment for me. Maybe when I getting even older and older and older. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, I would love to drive my six <laughs> Well, I'll, te I'll tell you, I, I think we're about the same age, but as you, as you, <laughs> as you get older, I, I feel like, I feel kind of like you, like I just, I think, you know what? I just want to have something comfortable now that's not noisy. Yeah, 
Exactly. Look at your, uh, you have an amazing uh, O37, uh, no? Yes, yes. It's more or less the same design of the F40. Yeah, it is, it is. It's like a miniature F40. There's so many similarities. You see the, you see the door come from a different yeah. car. You see the yeah. hood that it was designed for, <laughs> the, the rear part it was designed for. So at the it's, end is a, is a, is a fantastic it's car. It's a Frankenstein. The, the design is a Frankenstein, but the, the design was so good. It's so spontaneous. Yeah. That is a, beautiful object even because it was made for a specific purpose right i've always That's loved it. i've always I, for a while all i collected was was um was homologation and group b cars specifically because yeah. they were designed for a purpose and i found that exactly. very romantic i found that beautiful that there was only function to consider there was no exactly. thinking about oh i'm going to drive around and let people see how fancy i am it's just for this it was for this one thing it had to do and that I found beautiful. But you have that That's in the Octo. Why. The Octo is like yeah. that. It's yeah. one. The it's Octo is. A... Go ahead, go ahead. Well, well, I, well <laughs> you're the man who designed it. But I was going to say there's no, um, in a way, <laughs> in a weird way, it's not dissimilar to a Group B car, which is kind of weird <laughs> thing. To, which is kind of weird thing. But I mean, there's no, there's no uh, nod to, um, there's no additional aesthetical, aesthetic flourishes. No. No, honestly not, but uh, the bracelet is amazing. The buckle is amazing. In the buckle, it's fully integrated in the bracelet. For example, you see a true uh, industrial design approach. On the case, for sure, the idea and our obsession was to play with the round shape uh, bezel on the octagonal base because, you know, the octagon have a, a lot of meanings uh, around different culture. It's the perfect combination between circle and square. And in different religions and different cultures, the square and the and the and the circular shape are the life on earth and the life on heaven. So when you combine together the round shape and the square shape, you have the octagonal shape. That it means the perfect balance between life on earth and life on heaven. That's why you find octagonal elements in Egyptian uh, pyramid. You find octagonal elements in the Roman uh, jewelry. Is a part of uh, the human being uh, heritage. And again, I'm lost. Uh, so sorry for that. But... <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's all fascinating. Well, here, here's a thought. Uh, 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 is there something you would love to design? Like, is, is there a secret? The inner nerd Fabrizio would love to make like a perfect pair of jeans or a pen. Or is there a, a pen? A, uh, you'd a like pen. to make a pen? And maybe a pen. Now, no pair of jeans. I'm not in uh, in. Uh, in uh, how do you say uh, i i prefer art object hmm. i'm not in fashion or smooth okay. object because you cannot design in a in a proper way it's more sure. the fabrics and the model maker who make the difference um i would so love to design a you, pen what would you do if you if you were going to make up have you thought about it i'm sure yes. i'm sure some part you have i have tons of sketches about <laughs> pens because you know it, look at the this is my desk and i have this one i have uh, this one i have markers i have ballpoint pen i have different kind of markers i'm full of pen around me um again i didn't find the right one i start to use fountain pen in the airplanes but each time that you are in the middle of the idea the cartridge is empty <laughs> so I keep going crazy in a certain moment i call a company a pen company and say guys but why your cartridge is so small we can develop a pen together if you want with a huge cartridge and we completely see the things in a different way because i make a lot of sketches and honestly your cartridge is too small for me and uh and well, you know you, i are you familiar I, I'm with able, the uh... Are you familiar with the Fisher Space Pen? Yes, I like it in terms of aesthetics. I don't like it in terms of quality uh, of strokes for okay. my for uh, my drawings. Okay, uh, because is a is not a ballpoint pen. Is a roller, and right. with the roller, the problem that I have is that the, the stroke is always the same. On the ballpoint pen, you have a different level of uh, uh, of uh, Ink deepness dispersal. of the yes. On the on the roller is uh, always the same. It's just one straight line. And uh -huh. I use rollerball when I have a very clear idea in mind. So it's very precise drawings. When I don't have a very clear idea, but I'm trying to explore a new idea, I use a ballpoint pen because I can use it as a, as a pencil. 
Okay. Uh, when I want to make a more uh, fancy drawing uh, with a very interesting color of ink, uh, and I love the shades of the ink, uh, Japanese ink, uh, Hiroshizuku from Pilot, uh, I use a fountain pen because you see the time. You sketch with a fountain uh, on, pen. Yes, I sketch with fountain oh, pen, with amazing. markers, with the ballpoint pen and uh, and fountain pen. Uh, but with it's, all it's the, this, is, this is fascinating, Fabrizio, because it sounds like the, um, different pens and different inks are like different yes. tones, are like different tones of voice. Yes, exactly. Look at this sketch. This was made uh, after my trip in Mexico. It's made with the with the ballpoint pen. So as you can see, it's like. A, it's like a pencil. Look at yeah. this sketch. It's made uh, this morning, and uh, we talk about the movement. Right. It's uh, with a marker. So different purpose, uh, different tools. Right. So marker is like a command voice. Marker is uh, to shout, hey, yeah. I'm very yeah. specific. You command yeah. uh, yes, come on, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, fountain pen is more uh, when you have precise idea, different tone of voices you want to share and even your skills making drawings uh, because font and pen, you cannot make mistakes at the end. So what, what pen and ink do you use when you're, when it's, when you're unsure and it's imagination speaking? Uh, uh, ballpoint pen. I see. Okay. Yeah. Cause ballpoint it's like pencil. Pen, uh, it's like pencil for me. And oh. I'm, uh, I'm able to start a brand new fountain pen in the morning and it's completely dry in the, <laughs> in the evening. Yeah. <laughs> I, love, I have a lot of this pen and I use just the violet of the orange because I, in a certain moment I'm obsessed for some colors. So and, I feel uh, like your, your output of sketches is so prodigious, Fabrizio. Like uh, you must have, you must have thousands of ideas that, that may be a genius that you've completely forgotten about. I mean, do you have, no, but do, you, honestly, do you keep, do you have, do you keep all your, uh, do you keep all your books? You have no idea how many sketches <laughs> I have, I have no on idea. the table now. Honestly, just to can show you <laughs> all these are sketches and uh, I have a lot of paper. I have on the floor, uh, I think uh, 25 different sketches because I have to see all the things, the evolution of the, of the ideas. Um, I have do you a lot keep, of paper do you keep everything? Yes. Yes. So almost, what? almost <laughs> after two, three months, I start to say, okay, no, this is not interesting. This is not interesting. This is okay. And I start to destroy all the things that are not anymore interesting. Okay. Well, let me ask you this, because I find that, um, I find for me when I make art, um, and I have an idea, um, sometimes, well, I, I guess the question is this, do you, do you, sometimes uh sketch something and you think it's no good and then you look at it a couple of months later and you go ah yes. actually there's something interesting so yes um not so often honestly uh i'm able to say now this is an interesting idea we have to develop it but it's not the right moment so we take it out and we take it we don't uh, destroy it and maybe we will see in the next uh, few weeks or few months so where, where are all these tens of thousands of Fabrizio sketches stored? Are they, is there a Fabrizio temple of sketching <laughs> somewhere, a building? Look, look, you see this one is full, full of sketches, <laughs> full of folder of sketches behind me. <laughs> so I've, I, no, I, you, you honestly, is uh, yeah. tons, tons of paper. That's amazing. And, you, and you've never been tempted to, to go digital. I use digital. Yes, honestly, I use Wacom, I use tablet, I use uh, the iPad for sure. Mm. It's fantastic because you have all the tools that yeah. I have on my desk inside uh, the tablet. This is amazing. And I think that with the tablet, the only limit that you have, if you are able to manage this kind of uh, electronic device, is just your creativity. Because you can mix and match different style, different uh, softwares. At the end, this is the problem that a lot of young designers has today. They have so many things. And at the end, uh, if you don't have enough battery on your iPad, if you don't have uh, the right, uh, the right uh, I don't know, tools, at the end, if you don't find the right picture, they are not able to make sketches by hand at all. Ah, oh, that's interesting. This is the problem that we found when we hiring new designers. Everything is made with, uh, with, uh, with software, honestly. And this is... Uh, tell you something about the way that I have to imagine products. 
they work for images, but sometimes their brain are not able to create the images. They work for different images like a mood board, but they need to have the big pictures because otherwise they are not able to make connection between the different inspirations. Well, I, I wonder if the parameters of the software uh, create parameters of, in your imagination. Mm. Yes, sure. Possibly. That's interesting. The problem is that you have to be able to manage the softwares because if you are not able, is the man is the software that manage your design process. Right. right. And this is very uh, we find with some uh, with some young designers when we play with the 3D files, they start with an amazing rendering. They start to make shapes and they say, guys, I would love to change here and here, but they are not able to do it. And it's difficult in the automotive industry. They are absolutely obsessed for uh, three-dimensional shapes and that makes amazing 3D files. That's why today you see this kind of very difficult body, very complex surfaces, because at the end it's something that you cannot design by hand. Right. The computer and all the technology that they have now can make this kind of model, but otherwise it's impossible to imagine connection between two different kinds of shapes to create the perfect light. You know, when you design cars at the end, you design all the reflections, you develop right. and you design the body of the car, drawing all the reflection of the light is the light that gives you the expression of the body of the car. So is, that's really interesting, man. So then is there, is there a parallel in designing watches? Like, is there, is there, uh, a, like if light guides how you design a car? No, honestly, it, uh, in watches, in the automotive industry, they are uh, far away in terms of technology. Now we start to use the Googles to imagine and to see the product uh, 3D sketches. But I joined the Fiat in 1997, 1998. And when I left Fiat in 2001, we start to talk about a virtual reality room. Mm. So now, now in the watchmaking industry, they are very traditional. They love to make the things uh, in the same way. That's so the point. How quickly do you go from a sketch to, say, a, a, a model? Do you do a, do you make a three D print of something and then see how that looks physically? Yes, or yes, yes. yes. That, that, must have, that must have changed it, things radically. Ah, uh, but change completely because you have to imagine that uh, the first step is a is a plastic model, very quick now, very quick, mm. uh, and if it's okay, you start to have uh, a metal brass uh, uh, model, and after the steel one or titanium or, uh, but it's a long process because you need a five axis machine and uh, it costs a fortune. And this is amazing things to have a prototype of a case. Sometimes you have to wait one month, one month enough. When I was in Fiat in one month, we make a one on one scale model, <laughs> interior and exterior. So the time to market is totally different. So interesting. Are there materials that you would are there materials that you would like to try that you haven't tried yet? I mean there must be. Uh, material in terms of material on the octo we use a lot of different material. We start with the titanium, with the ceramic, with the carbon, with steel for sure, with the gold in sunblasted finishing. Um, we are still working on different material for the future. We are still working on the evolution of our iconic movement and we will see. But honestly, I prefer, honestly, feel to work on a common material in an unconventional way <laughs> because everybody can, everybody can call the most, the MIT to say, I would love to have the Bulgarium, <laughs> a small portion of uh, titanium, a small portion of steel and a small portion of uh, aluminum. What's right. happened? You have a metal alloy with exactly the same color of the other, but you can call with a different name and you could create a marketing story. Well, I what, prefer what to work. What you, this is interesting, man, because what you're talking about is, is, is people confusing uh, technique for idea. Ah, uh, yes, for sure. For sure. Honestly, uh, I prefer to work in this way. So everybody know the titanium, everybody know the minute repeater, nobody put the titanium and the minute repeater together. So this is something interesting because imagine you have to explain a brand new material with a brand new case, with a brand new design, with a brand new movement. And a certain moment, the clients say, guys, maybe it's too much. See you in the next 10 years. So even when you design an object, you have to pay attention. Uh, 
because sometimes often the client is not ready for many, many things. Look at us. We spent 10 years to say octo finissimo, octo finissimo, octo finissimo, titanium, ultra thin movement, different way to wear a grand complication watch. So they need time. And in the automotive industry, it's the same. The ultra thin. They're risky a lot. The, the, the ultra thin um, octo that you guys made, didn't it have a, a QR code on the. Yes. I, I, I actually think that I really, I thought, um, again, here's just some compliments from a very famous designer in New York, watch design. <laughs> I, th I thought that it would, I, th I thought that made the whole design because it was so unexpected. I'd even care if it was a functional QR code, just visually. I loved how that looked. Allora, uh, funny story. Uh, in a certain moment, they say, guys, the barrel is huge on this, uh, on the face of the watch, which kind of finishing uh, we have to use, Fabrizio. And they say, guys, I love, I hate this kind of finishing just to put a finishing on top. We have to find the story behind. So I would love to write something on top. No, it's not possible. I would love to open work execution. No, it's not possible. I would love to, no, it's not possible. In a certain moment, I say, okay, guys, we need a texture on top. I think that the octo shape, it's a, almost a square shape so with 45 degree angles, but is a portion of square. It's, be, it's a bit like a space invaders. <laughs> they say we... <laughs> they say, that would have been amazing. <laughs> you should do a space invaders version. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you. Hey, look at me. <laughs> now you cannot see now, me that I make sketches. Seeing, I it's going to be live, so, live. <laughs> the Octo is uh, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> it is like a no, space invader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. it looks uh, just a small portion square yeah. elements cut 45 degree angles. Yeah. I say, guys, we're going to use a QR code. In terms of uh, pattern, it's perfect because it's a square pattern. The watch is almost square. And, uh, you know, I say to Philippe, the, the product development director, say, Philippe, you know, if we're going to use a QR code, we're going to make something different on the watch. So I would love to have on my mobile phone, I took the QR code and I open a digital world. So, mm -hmm. guys, the watch, it becomes a gate between the most incredible Swiss watch making know-how and the metaverse world. So we use the most incredible uh, heritage to talk about something that doesn't exist yet. This was the claim, but as a designer, you could have some ideas and you could have a people who work with you able to turn this idea in a real product. But no, you miss the other part of the project. If you don't have a boss that is crazy, almost like you, you are dead because sure. come on, go of back course. in the office. I say to Antoine, Antoine, we're going to have a QR code on, side, uh, on top of the barrel. <laughs> wow, fantastic idea. <laughs> so at the end, uh, we are a, a small, a small group of crazy, crazy people. Well, that look, that's the only way that genius happens is that you have to, you have to have someone who will like yourself, who is, who is, who's got extraordinary ideas, but then you have to have someone who will allow those, the world to see those ideas. So. At the end, uh, again, you have to turn constraints in opportunity. Otherwise, yeah. uh, it's become boring uh, and uh, you make something just for you. Not I've, for always like, found, uh, I've always found constraints really uh, exciting to work with because it's a force to push against. And when you're pushing against that force, it gives me, it gives you this kind of kinetic energy to figure out ways around it, like water. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You have to be able to see the things on upside down or in the, in a different way, because each time you have a different opportunity. Now we have uh, another big, big uh, aesthetical constraints. And I say, guys, you have to see the things in a different way. We have to turn these kind of constraints. What's happening if I look at these things in a different way? And honestly, sometimes we have good ideas. Sometimes uh, we don't have the idea. This is another point. You have to be able to nourish your creativity. It's like a grass. In a certain moment, you have to cut and you have so to wait that it grow up again. What, what do you nourish it with? I, I do Denim. nothing. I make sketches every day. <laughs> no, no, no. Denim, no, 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 endless no. amounts of jeans. <laughs> yes, a lot of music, uh, denim, uh, exhibitions, or uh, just have a look at the book uh, that I love or a different book. Uh, uh, but today with the internet, uh, with the Instagram, uh, you can make a lot of different things. I, I find um, 
the origin of ideas, it, you, I would imagine that when people ask you, where do your ideas come from? You don't know. It's this, in, it's this indefinable source, right? I, <laughs> I, 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 I always found that ideas are sort of like gate crashers. You know what a gate crasher is? Mm -hmm. It's someone who shows yeah. up at a party unannounced. And that's what yeah. I think I, ideas are sort of like that. They just kick the door open. They go, I'm here. And you go, I don't know. And you have no idea where they came from, but they come from everything you've seen and you've watched. Exactly. And and, right. Exactly. Exactly. This is the point. So many things you see, so many things you are able to draw and so many things you are able to imagine. But if you are not uh, able to see things in a different way as a designer or as a creative people, you have you have to be able to get the antenna always able to get things. No, I spend yeah. a lot of time when I when I am in London, in Tokyo, in New York, or I don't know, I was in Mexico City, around the corner on the street, just to have a look. The people, just walking the, around. The, the, yes, they're walking around or look at the people, the way that they have to wear some specific things. Because the people can tell you a lot of things. The people can tell you they hide the needs because sometimes the client doesn't know that they need something. <laughs> you have to explain, you know, that right. you need these kind of things. And you say, yes, wow, it's amazing. Now I need it. But some other times it's so difficult. And if you don't have the right questions, why? I think it's uh, you don't have the right product, honestly. You know that, um, I don't know if, I, I remember reading this story about Philip Stark, the industrial designer. Yeah that he would keep a motorcycle in all the major capital cities of the world. Do you know this story? Yeah. And he would drive around his motorcycle just to kind of absorb, exactly as you say, yeah. like the, the essence of the city, what people are wearing, all the rest of all that kind of stuff. You, I mean, yes, the color. You, yeah. You, 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 I, I really admire the way, um, the conceptual nature of your thinking. And I think one, one idea that I thought was really inspired was the sketch Ah, but yes. You know, the, the because sketch it's is an like... idea. It's, 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 it, I have to say, Fabrizio, it's one of the first times I've seen a real concept in a watch other than, you know, oh, we're just going to make it, we're going to, I don't know. Like it just, it was such a definitive concept. To, to I found yeah. that fascinating. That was very, very it honestly, was an instinct. It was not the right, the first idea. Mm. We tried several things. It was not happy at all. And in a certain moment, I say, guys, why don't you put uh, the, one of the first sketches that we made uh, on top of the dial? But can honestly, I ask, what, what were the things that didn't work? Can can you can you reveal? Um, I honestly, I honestly, I don't remember. It was some uh, color or some finishing, uh, but it was not the, again. It was not a clear idea. It was we try and we try. And at a certain moment, I say, nah, honestly, who cares about that? Why don't you put the, the, the one of the first catches that we made? But uh, who cares even about this idea? No, 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 no. This is a fantastic idea. So we spent eight months for the prototypes because it looks simple. But at the end, when the object, it looks simple, you have a lot of people behind. You have a huge process behind to make the thing simple. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the dial is made with the laser and the... Uh, you know, my obsession to draw and the strokes. And I say, guys, we have a construction line and we have the indexes. These two lines have to be, must have a different thickness because otherwise everything is, uh, is uh, you cannot understand nothing. And we make several trials. Uh, and uh, I think after six months, uh, we found the right balance with the laser because the, the dial we made in house, it's made with a laser machine. And say, Fabrizio, now what do you think? Because I'll tell you, Fabrizio, this is the last uh, <laughs> chance that we have, the last option. Say, fantastic, now we are okay. But it's but a that's long your process. Sketch. That's your sketch, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the, the sketches that we made, right. because at the beginning, the idea was, guys, all the element of this watch have to say, hey, I'm the thinnest. So ultra thin indexes, very thin uh, seconds, uh, very thin small second counters, the logo, the 12, the six, uh, we make several trials and all the things have to say, I am the thinnest. So I, I would love to have a certain consistency in terms of design, shapes, uh, proportions, and graphical elements, because otherwise you mix and match different style and different, uh, different word, and it's getting confusing. Do you think you're a, a good person to work for? No. <laughs> <laughs> so 
absolutely not. You have to ask to the people behind the, the, the wall. No, no, no. I'm absolutely impossible to, to, I'm never satisfied, never satisfied. And with this kind of skills that I have, they make a proposals of different things. Uh, and I say, this is wrong. Why don't you make the right thickness of the indexes? You are right. We don't have enough time. So immediately after, I don't know, 20 years in the company and more or less 30 years on, on the industry, uh, that's the point. You see immediately the things that are wrong. Right. Well, I would imagine maybe you're a benevolent dictator. <laughs> <laughs> you know, creativity is not a democratic process. Absolutely, man. Unfortunately, Absolutely. unfortunately yeah. there is one person that have the idea. Yeah. If it's the right one, you have to follow. Uh, otherwise, if it's not the right one, uh, you, you have to deal with. This is the problem sometimes with the collaboration. Sometimes it's amazing. Sometimes are very, very tough, honestly. Well, you, you've, it seems like you've only collaborated with Japanese artists. Is that, is that, am I right about because that? The, yes, because the Japanese team, the Bulgari team in Japan are very reactive and there's amazing connection. Mm. Honestly, we receive a lot of requests and we are still today working to have some collaboration with European artists or some artists from US. And after six, eight months, nine months, we are still waiting for a meeting. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I want to visit your manufacturing site. No, it's better in my studio. No, now I'm, I'm not uh, available because I'm working on an exhibition. Yes, but you know, after I have to make a film. So, Honestly, it's not so easy at all. Even if we talk with uh, Tadao Ando or Sejima or uh, uh, Hiroshi Senju, Ryuichi Sakamoto, this is the schedule and this is the schedule. That's it. They travel around the world like crazy. Sharp. This is our meeting. We start at the time and we finish at the time. You are happy? Yes. You are not happy? We're going to have another meeting. But today, I'm sorry, but you know, they are very precise. They are very, well, it's a I bit also, sometimes uh, the problem of hierarchy, but anyway. I would also imagine that there's a, there's a, there's a kinship because so much of how you seem to think is about, is a, is, re, is reduction is you, 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 mm. you're shaving yeah. away until you get to the very fine point. Yeah. And this particular yeah. thing is the idea. Yes, exactly. And, exactly. and in Japan, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a reflex like that. of shaving away until yes. this is the final thing. And there's yes. no excess. Uh, sometimes the most difficult things is to follow uh, some very important guests uh, in the watchmaking industry because they their their creativity is for uh, different surfaces, different proportions, and different uh, sizes. So mm -hmm. sometimes it looks simple because they are making building uh, huge things around the world on huge uh, piece of art and they say but come on is it just a watch you can do it but unfortunately uh, to do it we have to spend yes to do this we have to spend two years of development and honestly <laughs> we cannot do it so sometimes it's not so easy some other times is uh, perfect uh, uh, well done uh, you need just one meeting two meetings and uh, everybody's happy I, in my dreams, I imagine that's how the Tadao Ando watch happened because it, that watch is so, I've always been a huge fan of his architecture mm. and that watch is such a perfect articulation of his, how he designs, it seems to me. You know, Tadao is uh, an amazing uh, architect, honestly. I met mm. him uh, the first time in his own studio in Osaka and uh, the studio is unbelievable because as you can imagine in Japan, they don't have so many room and surfaces. So it's a very uh, rectangular, uh, not neither square, but is with the four, five floors developments full of books around uh -huh. everywhere and maquettes and models. So right. we arrived with some, uh, no, we were a bit... Uh, Honestly, we try to make something easier. We arrived with some ideas, but it was impossible. So Tadao is uh, is absolutely full of energy and creativity. And he say, Fabrizio, I have a problem. The watch is almost perfect. And I don't know if my, I'm able to do something better than this one. And this is a great problem for me because I love to work with concrete and the watch is in titanium and is almost the same color. The watch is a thin the proportion are beautiful. The bracelet is amazing. So I don't know if I might be able to do something better than your watch. So for me, that's it. My <laughs> career is done. 
<laughs> <laughs> and we start the discussion about, uh, yes, but we can do this, this and that. Uh, Tadao disappeared for six months, totally disappeared. Start to travel around different uh, different uh, places around the world. In a certain moment, uh, he arrives with uh, with this uh, this sketch. <laughs> right. And uh, and I say, Fabrizio, I would love to talk about the black hole because I was I was shocked by the first picture of the black hole. And uh, I say, Tadao is an amazing idea because we talk about time, we talk about thickness. Uh, uh, ultra thin watches and the black hole is the biggest and the huge things in the universe and it's the creation of time and light so for us it's amazing but unfortunately we have just uh, now five millimeters to talk about that okay okay i'll take care and he arrives with this sketch with all the 12 the indexes the bulgari logo all the things like a common watch mm. I say, okay, Tadao, the idea is amazing, but honestly, I don't need the logo. I don't need the 12. I don't need all the indexes. So this is your dial. It's uh, your room, your space uh, is empty space for you, and you have to do all what you want. And this is for him, it was an amazing uh, uh, approach. And he say, I cannot imagine that a Bulgari, huge brand like Bulgari can, is able to remove the logo from the dial. I say, this is your watch. And I think the second one, it's even better because you have the same drawings made on a dark blue dial with the, on the ceramic case with the slice of moon that comes out because you see that light that start to comes out from the black hole. And for me, the second dial is a perfect example of uh, uh, Zen garden, Japanese mm -hmm. Zen garden, yeah. in sense of proportions, the slice of moon, the center of the spiral that is not exactly at the center of the small second counter, because they love these kind of things. And to do I this, actually thought the first amazing... design. I, I thought the first design, the first Ando watch, was some iteration of a Zen garden. I didn't realize it was based yeah. on the idea of a black hole. Well, even um, it's a matter of taste at the end. Uh, it's the yeah. first time that I prefer the second execution instead of the first one. Yeah, usually the first thing is the best thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, look, we've been talking for so long, Fabrizio. Uh, I mean, it's been it's been the most glorious conversation, man. Uh, I, I guess I, I, I guess we should probably wrap it up, but I, I would like to really thank you for being so. I don't so just just being Fabrizio for being so candid, for being full of interesting things and eccentric, yeah. and and showing us your drawings and all the rest of it, man. So. <laughs> Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for, for coming right. on the podcast, man. It was a real joy. It was a great pleasure. And now I'm very happy that uh, I'm a part of the Viva Bastardo family. So it's, uh... <laughs> I will happily send you some Viva Bastardo t-shirts if you like. Yes, please, please, please. I'd send oh, you some I would sketches. Be, I would be delighted, that. man. I'd be delighted. <laughs> and right. next time that I'm in New York, I, I'll call you. And uh, Oh, I would love that. that. I would love that, man. Yeah. We go out for a yeah. cup of tea or something or coffee or and, whatever it is. And if you if you are in Switzerland or in Europe, uh, we can. Uh, of course, I'll let, you know uh, yes. I'll let you know because yeah. I'm actually probably going okay. in a couple of months. Well, anyway, look, thank you so much again. Great. Thank you great. so much. It was a right. great pleasure. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, man. Ciao.